We're going to start with chapter 14 now, talking about physical disabilities and people with other health impairments, or OHI. Um, this verse refers to the fact that Jesus healed many people who had different medical issues. And in this case, it was a lady who'd been sick for decades of her life, but Jesus healed her, and she was free from that. And we know that through God and Jesus' power, many people can be healed, but we have others who are with us who need special help and assistance. One of those types of persons is a person who has an orthopedic handicap or disability. Now, in public school, you have to have a medical physician state that a child has an orthopedic handicap for him or her to get help. It'll be less than 1% of the school population, so a real low number, just like vision and hearing impairments. Um, but you do need to keep in mind, child could have more than one disability. For instance, child might have cerebral palsy and also be moderately intellectually disabled or have ADHD or be autistic or any of the other 14 categories or so. Um, well, to qualify in public school, the orthopedic problem must hinder the person's mobility to one or more of the skeletal muscular parts of their body, meaning hands, legs, feet, arms. Okay? Slide 5 tells you some of the professionals who will work with the child who may have an orthopedic problem. You have teachers who go to college and they major in orthopedic disabilities and they work with such children. You'll have occupational therapists, physical therapists, and speech therapists if the child's medical condition affects speech and communication. Um, well, the orthopedically handicapped special ed teacher can provide follow-up to what the therapists do by helping. For instance, let's say that an occupational therapist comes in two days a week and works with the child for 30 minutes each time. Well, they can give the teacher a list of things that can be done with this child the other three days to help exercise those little fingers. Okay? Um, and same thing with physical therapy, exercises that the child can do to try to improve their gross motor skills. These teachers also may have to tube feed children who, if they are um, disabled to the extent that they can't even eat food normally or swallow and might need to be tube fed. In that case, the teacher may puree food and it's poured into a funnel and that goes into a tube but that's in an opening in the child's stomach. And that's how the child is fed, through G-tube. Um, or the child may have some sort of formula like Boost that you can buy in the store, uh, protein and vitamin-enriched drinks that are used. Um, one of the main things to be wary of in the classroom, if you have a number of children in wheelchairs or walkers, of course, is the layout of the classroom. You have to have enough space for wheelchairs to get in between desks or tables. And most of the time, these classes usually have tables in them, not desks. Desks aren't that conducive um, to helping children who have mobility issues. And if they can pull a wheelchair up or pull a chair up to a table, if they are ambulatory and able to walk, then that's preferred. They don't want too much furniture in the classroom out in the middle. You need space to turn the wheelchairs around and things. In addition to all these things, my goodness, the teacher is responsible for academic instruction. And I once worked with a young lady who was very delightful. She was in a wheelchair, and she was smart. And I would go in every day and work with her when I was doing an internship at a school up in Columbia. And it really taught me a lot about compassion and working with someone with that type of special need because she tried very hard to do what she could do, and I admired her for that. Children with health impairments or who are orthopedically impaired may be very smart, or they could be severely mentally disabled. Don't get fooled. Sometimes we tend to judge people when we shouldn't, don't we? Well, you may see someone in a wheelchair who's drooling, and doesn't seem to have good control of their arms or hands or legs, or maybe they don't even move their legs. And you think, oh, this person must be severely intellectually disabled. This person's probably not very smart. 
Well, don't let that fool you because there are a lot of children, teens, and adults who have full use of their mental faculties when it comes to intellectual abilities, but they're just not able to walk or they're just not able to move or control the saliva coming out of their mouth. So you need to make sure that you find out what that person's abilities are and speak to them accordingly. You know, don't use baby talk with someone just because they're in a wheelchair because many people will find it very insulting. Um, and I think of my nephew, Brandon, when he was little. The nurse came in and asked my sister, well, how am I supposed to let him know what I'm going to do when I'm going to do his blood pressure? My sister said, just tell him you're going to take his blood pressure. Well, she hadn't really read his records, so she didn't realize that he was comprehending pretty much everything she said. She thought that he was severely disabled because he had cerebral palsy. And so she learned a little less than that day. You know, that Brandon was smarter than she thought. Um, and so she knew that she could deal with him like any other child when it came to explaining things to him that they would have to do. Um, cerebral palsy is lack of muscle tone or control that affects, it can be your arms, your legs, your hands, um, the trunk of your body, neck muscles, mouth, throat muscles, ability to swallow, so forth. Why does this happen? Well, it can be brain damage. It can happen during birth. It can happen because the person has a condition known as hydrocephaly or microcephaly. Hydrocephaly, of course, is also known as water on the brain or fluid on the brain. And the person's skull swells because there's too much fluid that's not draining down through the body. And then they have to put a stent in, which is just a plastic tube that runs from the head down through the body and then the fluid drains down and is released through the body in the normal way that any liquid waste would be when a person urinates. Um, people with cerebral palsy sometimes wear these plastic molded shapes on their legs. They're known as AFOs, that's a short name for them, and they're helping to keep the legs straight. If the person does not wear the AFOs, the number of hours a day they're supposed to, the leg will tend to draw up if the person has cerebral palsy. And the leg may drop so much that even the physical therapist cannot straighten the leg out without breaking it. Now that sounds pretty gruesome and it certainly would be. So that's why it's so important for parents to realize, you know, my, if my child has braces or my child has these AFOs, needs to wear them. Because if not, the end result can be so much worse and the child's digestive system, spine, everything can be influenced because the child's body starts to just draw up and the child can't even use the bathroom properly and things like that. Um, and of course, there are surgeries that are available, back surgeries, leg surgeries, and, and hip surgeries that can be done also. My nephew's been through a number of those. He's had a lot of operations in his life, God bless him. Um, but hasn't had to have any in, in a few years, fortunately. But it's just one of those things to help keep the person healthy and to keep their body systems running. Sometimes they have to have different surgeries to help them out. Um, well, children with cerebral palsy may be ambulatory. They may be able to walk or be in a stander or wheelchair part of the day. A stander looks like a big wooden box. And they stand the child up, these Velcro straps to straighten out the legs. And the child is kind of hooked in to the device and can stand up and work like a puzzle or a book to read or something can be put on a tray that's on the front part of the box and the child can do classwork. It looks sort of archaic or almost like some medieval torture device when you see one. But the point of the child being placed in the stander and standing up a certain number of minutes a day or an hour a day is to strengthen the leg muscles in the hopes that one day the child will be able to learn how to walk. And if you don't bear weight on your legs, that's when they tend to draw up and atrophy. And then they're not really of much use when it comes to mobility. Here's some terms that you need to look up in your textbook. Paraplegic is one you've probably heard before. But I want you to look up hemiplegic and quadriplegic and be able in class to explain what those conditions are. So make sure you do that before you come to the next class. Some other types of orthopedic handicaps or impairments are people can have some type of birth defect where they're born missing a hand or missing a leg. Um, also, 
a person with condition like diabetes or who gets some kind of blood poisoning or gangrene or some serious illness may have to have a limb removed or part of a limb removed. Someone who's in a bad accident may have to have part of their body amputated or severe burns like third degree burns on an extremity like a hand or a leg may necessitate the removal of some toes or some fingers or a hand um, or a severe fracture that doesn't heal right may also cause a person to have some kind of orthopedic disability. Now, will the child qualify for some special ed help from a teacher for children with orthopedic impairments? Well, only if it's a long-term situation that's going to affect the child's academic performance and the ability to move around in the school. For instance, if little Tony falls off the monkey bars at school and breaks his arm, goes to the doctor, and Tony is told, okay, we put the cast on, your arm's going to heal up, we'll take it off in six weeks, you should be fine. Then the answer is no, Tony does not qualify for any kind of therapy or special ed help at school because in a manner of weeks, this cast is going to be removed and things should probably be very fine. But in the case of conditions where it is long term and going to affect the child, then therapy may be provided. Uh, here's another thing to remember, Section 504 of the Americans with Disabilities Act, okay, ADA is a federal law that says people with disabilities have a right to be able to enter public buildings. There should be bathrooms that are accessible to people in wheelchairs in public buildings. There should be ramps for the person to get in. There should be curbs cut if needed. In the case of children who are participating in physical education and required to take showers, a shower may have to be modified for someone in a wheelchair. School districts have to provide transportation to school, therefore, there are many buses with lifts, so someone in a wheelchair can be picked up daily and taken to school, just like regular children ride a regular school bus. And my nephew did that for years. He rode the minibus, picked him up right in front of his house. He went to school and brought him back home, and that was how it should be. You often hear realtors use the term location. Location, location, location. Well, if you're a teacher, if you aspire to be an administrator, then you need to think about that when it comes to children with special needs. If children have mobility issues, it might be good to place their classroom in a central area in the school where they're able to get to many of the places they need to go on a regular basis, such as the library, cafeteria, um, or go out to the playground, getting on and off the school bus easily, especially having a covered area to get on the bus in case it rains, or if you're in a place where it snows, when it's snowing or icing, so because it's going to take the child longer to get on the bus than an average child who may just kind of run out the door and jump up on the bus. So you have to think about those things. So the place where those classes are located in the school can be very important and also very crucial to seeing that the children are included in things. If music takes place in a trailer, a portable, out behind the school, and there's no ramp, the children can't go to music class and participate with other children. So district may need to either move the music class inside for a year or two while the child's there, or they may need to build a ramp. And I worked in a district before where we had to do just that, build some ramps so the children could get out to music and art. And before I was special ed director, those kids didn't get to go, which was against federal law. Um, so I had to put my foot down on that and say, these kids have a right to be out there and you have to let them go. So we had to do some of those things. Um, there's also adaptive equipment that can be purchased for the physical education program or for children to use on the playground. There are even swings that have a flat metal base that you can roll a wheelchair onto, strap it in, and you can swing the child. Not real high, but you can let them swing and feel that motion, that movement. And the children really enjoy it when they get to participate like that. And there's other kinds of playground equipment that's a lower height that might benefit such children. Those occupational therapists, what do they do? Well, they've been to college just like you, and they have a bachelor's degree in occupational therapy or may even have a master's degree. They work with the child on what are called fine motor skills, mainly involving the fingers and the movement of the hand. Okay. 
So anything that can help a child improve the use of the fingers and the hands are what's important. Child may be with that person once or twice a week and do things like playing with Play-Doh. Okay, doing fun things like that. Tossing a light ball back and forth. Um, cutting, pasting, gluing things, doing puzzles. Anything to help improve skills so that child can do things like draw or write or color or maybe be able to use a computer keyboard if that's not already a possibility. What about the physical therapist? Slide 15. Okay, they are working with gross motor skills. In other words, arms and legs, big movements. So they will help the child do many exercises related to stretching. Again, if a child has something like cerebral palsy, cerebral palsy they really need to be stretched out is what the term that's used so that those muscles won't draw up. Um, they help the child with standing, walking, keeping their balance, walking on a balance, low balance beam, that kind of thing. And if the child is able to walk. Well, who gets these services? Hmm. Read this paragraph and think about it. Will this child qualify to receive occupational therapy on his hand at school? Well, it depends. If the child is able to write and do things with the non-dominant hand, or excuse me, with the, with the dominant hand, the stronger hand, then they, he or she may not qualify for physical therapy or occupational therapy at school. But parents can provide that through insurance. Or Medicaid, if the child's on Medicaid, it may be provided outside of the school setting. But if it is really affecting the child's ability to do schoolwork, then he or she may qualify. So it depends. And of course, the child would have to be functioning below grade level due to that particular disability.